it was a reflection on myself. And so I just ended up very, very insecure. And it was very easy for me to question if I was good enough to be in the position I was in. Um, right. Cause I was fortunate to have a lot of great relationships and a lot of great people, both on the racing and personal side. And it just made me question if I deserved everything I was getting and if I was mm -hmm. good enough for everything I was doing, that sort of thing. Um, right. And it wasn't like, it didn't take a big event to get me there. It took very, very little to push myself back into that little zone. Um, and it just, it makes it really hard to accomplish things. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Eyes Wide Open. Today we have Josh Green, who is a indie race car driver. And what we're going to talk about today is very interesting. He's going to teach us a little bit about racing, but um, I was introduced to Josh a few weeks ago from a mutual friend or contact, uh, business partner, whatever you want to say. And um, you know, they they wanted to get us introduced because Josh has had a basically has grown up with racing, right? With, with being a race driver. He started when he was 12 years old uh, to be competitive. And then even at the age of nine was already in go-kart racing. Um, but one of the things that is super interesting to me about Josh is the fact that he is already so successful and he spent his, um, you know, high school years and, and now his college years uh, really being focused on racing in his career. And what I like talking to him about is all the pressures that come with that. When you're growing up and you're involved in school and, you know, have to have a social life and also spend all this time racing to the point where he was missing many days of schooling and many opportunities for socialization and the impacts that has on your mental health and your overall performance and wellness in life. So once I got to, to know Josh's story a little bit, I thought it'd be great to have him on the podcast so he can talk about what some of those pressures are like when you're, um, you know, growing up in, with the goal of becoming a professional racer and when you're trying to go through school and you're trying to appease coaches and sponsorships and all the pressure that comes with that. So, so Josh and I are going to discuss what those pressures look like what his experience growing up in racing has been like, and then also what are some of the things that he does to help keep his sanity, to help keep himself focused and not fall into um, you know, any type of negative thought patterns if a performance doesn't go well or if there's extra stress in other areas of his life. So this is a, a really interesting conversation. And I feel like when we look at racers or we look at people who perform for a living uh, in a professional sport or any manner, I think we should really give them some grace and understand that they are under all different kinds of pressures as well. And that can have a toll on you. So I hope this helps you look at performances and racing even a little bit more. And um, next time you watch a race or interact with someone who's performing, I hope you go into that with your eyes wide open. All right. Today we have Josh Green as our guest. Josh is an esteemed racing driver and he is set to compete in the 2023 Indy NXT driving for HMD Sports with Dale Coyne Racing. He's already achieved 10 wins, 27 podiums and seven pole positions in his career. Josh, thanks for coming on. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. I'm good. Yeah. Thanks for coming on today. It's going to be, uh, I think we're going to have a good combo. So I, I told you this before, but like, I'm not super um, up to speed, I guess on racing. Although, you know, I know last time we talked, it was about to, we were about to have NASCAR here in Chicago, which was a total disaster as I'm sure you probably saw with, yeah. with like the rainiest day we've ever had in the history of Chicago on the day yep. that the finals were supposed to be. So, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the type of racing you do. And maybe for those who don't know what pole and podiums means, I think everyone knows what wins mean, but it'd be great to hear what you do from your own words. Yeah. So, so I'm a racing driver. Um, I race in what we call formula cars. So I think the majority of people have heard of formula one. Um, it's sort of that style car, but in America. So the top level series in the U S is called IndyCar, which is really what I'm striving to get into. Um, I've been racing ever since I was 12 years old. Um, a lot of people in racing start when they're five or six. So 
it's mm. definitely one of those sports that starts from very, very young. Um, and so podiums are anyone who finishes in the top three. Everyone who finishes in the top three gets gets a trophy and gets to spray champagne. Um, and then pole positions are qualifying before the race. So we have a session before every race that's based on time. So whoever can do the fastest lap time around the circuit will then start in that order for the race. So if you qualify on pole, you get to take a picture with a big check that you never get to cash in. <laughs> so what, what's the check then? Is it just semantics? Photo? No, up? we get a small one after, right. but we don't get, you know, like, you know, they give out those show checks that are like massive and you're like, look, there's like a hundred thousand dollars and it's, you know, no. Well, n now you, you can kind of do that through your phone anyway. So just step back a little for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're waiting for someone to do that, like online, on right. a live stream, just pick their phone up and be like, click. <laughs> well, now, now you know what to do next time you get one of those. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I like to start all these the same way. Um, and obviously, you're still, um, you know, in, in your, your 21, I think, right? Your early 20. 20s, 20. Yeah. So what did you, so you started when you were 12 so pretty clear that you had interest in racing what did you want to be prior to knowing you were going to be a racer or has it always been that way and how's that changed it's funny it's always been that way um i have like you know in kindergarten you always take a picture like holding up you're like when i grow up i want to be x and x and you're like astronaut or whatever mine said race car driver i have a picture of me and however old you are in kindergarten holding up a sign that says i want to be a race car driver when i grow up so definitely started from when i was little um but I don't know where it came from. No one in my family has ever been in racing. So, well, first of all, I think that's really cool because as you said, when I ask this question, people always have something lofty when they're a kid. And then it seems like they, they sort of lose that as time goes on. It's always astronaut, writer, you know, maybe a race car driver, but you're actually doing it. So when did you, what was your first race? Like, when did you have that? So I started in go-karts, which most people do. Um, and like, it's, any little indoor go-kart track you can go to, right? You go to the local place, pay 20 bucks and get to do an eight minute session to go-kart. Um, and so when I was 12, my mom found a like go-kart track nearby. They had a little summer camp. Um, and I went over there and, and drove for a week and they were like, Hey, you're good. You should come race in our series. And I raced in that for a bit. Um, and prior to that, when I was around nine, so my house is like, we have like our little plot of land and then just like woods behind us and it's all our land, but it's like completely unusable. And one day we were walking down there, me and my dad, and my dad was like, we should build a go-kart track. And I was nine and I wasn't going to say no to building a go-kart wow, track. That's the coolest so, thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. So we got the rakes out. We started, we raked out a track. We like cut down some logs and laid out like the sides of it. And we bought like a dune buggy off Amazon for like 300 bucks. And it was not at all prepared for what it was about to be put through. <laughs> um, but we rightfully destroyed it for about three years until I started actually oh, wow. racing in, in cars or wow. real go-karts. So did your, your dad have any, um, like intuition that you wanted to race or was he, was he just thinking that would be a cool thing to do? Cause heck you're nine years old and good bonding experience. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Right. Like as a kid, I was always very into cars. I had like a million toy cars and, and was into building Legos and all that little like hands-on stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I think my dad and, and I like always bonded over cars when I was a kid, we'd go to cars and coffee and like all that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't really know how it like eventualized into racing. It, it just kind of slowly pushed in that direction. And the second we got that dune buggy, I don't know what, how that idea popped into his head, but the second that appeared, it was kind of destined to happen. Oh, wow. It's like game on. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So then, <clears throat> so you raced for three years. Uh, what was like the biggest thing that you learned putting that car through the, the ringer? <laughs> The dune buggy, like I never was really racing against anyone, right? It's just in my right. backyard, but I'm pounding around. Um, what did I learn? I don't know. I feel like I, like that's what the root of, we all say car control, but for the reality, it's like certain drivers are better at controlling like the, when the car is moving around. So like in the wet or it's even racing on dirt, like you get much more comfortable mm. having the car like on a slip angle, sliding around and, and not being under control. Um, and I think I learned a fair amount of that down there and picked up some solid habits as a kid. Um, but I learned a lot about weight transfer because it was a two seater go-kart. Um, and if I was sitting alone on my one side, cause I had a lap counter, I realized that I couldn't go as fast as I wanted to through the corners or I'd flip because all mm. the weight was on the one side. So then I got a friend to come over and threw him in the passenger seat and learned, had my first physics lesson myself, which was, you know, weight being on one side of a thing, turning too hard. It's going to flip over. So, right. 
Well, that hey, yeah. that's useful. That's useful. And also just the wherewithal to bring a friend over so you could test the physics of it all, I guess. <laughs> For sure. My poor friend having to <laughs> 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 screaming the whole time around the track. What was it? What was it like racing, like going through high school and just being in having school, but kind of being, you know, in that age frame, all these things going on because that's what high school is like. And then also trying to evolve your racing because you had to have gotten so much better to be where you are now at 20 when you were in school still. Yeah. So a lot of kids do high school privately or go into homeschooling or just kind of ignore it altogether. Um, I was very lucky. Like I went to public high school. Um, they were really, um, they're really good with us for obviously you end up missing a lot of school. Right. So like when I was in, in karting nationally and then moved into formula 1600, which was my first foray into cars, I was probably missing 40 to 50 days of the school year. Um, and you know, because the race weekends, usually you were on track on Friday, which means you had to be at the track all day Thursday, which meant flying in Wednesday, right? So right. that's two days every race weekend. Uh, and a lot of them were before and after the summer break for school. So I'd miss a ton of school. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of meetings and, and the school was basically just like, as long as you stay above like a 3 we we'll be cool with it. Mm -hmm. So now... I will be honest, I was I don't think a lot of people were highly motivated in high school to do well academically. I definitely wasn't. Um, but the second it was introduced that I had a grade limit and that if I didn't do well in school, I couldn't race, all of a sudden mm -hmm. I was like very dead set on being very good at school um and getting everything done ahead of time so I could go racing. Yeah. Uh when it comes to developing racing, it was funny. Um I forgot who it was, it was one of my friends, but at one point they came up to me and noticed that I was missing so much school and they were like like, you must be really good at this. Like, they suddenly realized, like, oh, you must be pretty good at racing because right. you're missing, like, half the school year to go do it. And I was Which like, at, oh, I at that age, that. that's like everybody's priority is pretty much high yeah. school and socializing. Exactly. Because yeah. you're, I mean, but that's what's in front of you, right? Like, that's so, and it was weird. Like, I, I just had such different motivation from everyone in a way, um, alienating a bit um, because I missed a lot of school and, like, having friend groups and stuff at high school. And I had a lot of friends at the racetrack. Um, and especially as you move through racing, you're hanging out with people who are a lot older than you mm -hmm. and you grow to sort of be a lot more comfortable with, I mean, even right now, like my girlfriend's in college and I'll go and hang out with all of her friends and stuff. And I definitely find it hard to like blend in with people my age a lot of the time. And I actually want to touch on that a little bit more, but beforehand, when you were missing those days in school, did you have to like do homeschooling or wherever you were traveling schooling? Yes and no. Less in high school than I do now because I'm going to college online now um, okay. and I have to do so much work. Like there'll be times where I have a race that day and it's like 9 a.m. and I'm in the hotel room doing an exam or something like that, which is crazy. Right. Do you mind me asking what you're in school for? Mechanical engineering. Oh, makes sense. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Typical for sure for what I'm doing. <laughs> um, with high school, it was a lot more like – I think the teachers were a lot more lenient. I think a lot of them, you know – there's a, there's a definitely a range. There was the high school teachers who were like, we're super motivated that you're like out doing what you want to do. And right. like, and then there were the other high school teachers where it's like, I can't believe that you're focusing on anything other than school and you're inevitably going to be a failure. Um, and those like, teachers what were the heck like what yeah. I had those teachers too. I had the yep. ones that were like, cause I actually wanted to be a filmmaker, which I was going to bring up the age thing with that. And so in high school I started writing and then started to like take the opportunity to do like videos and movies for projects when they were there. And some, some teachers were like, heck yeah, skip the paper, make a short film or something like that. Um, and then other ones were like, this is stupid. You're never going to make it. Why do you spend so much time writing? Why do you, you know, it's like, yeah, what, what is the, what is that high school? They're supposed to encourage you. So I'm sorry you, you went through that. No, I'm sorry. You went through that for sure. I, it is odd. Like I never understood the I never understood like the underlying, like what, did, was it just jealousy or something like that from an adult looking at you, like trying to accomplish something, but you know, whether or not they think we're going to fail, even just constructive criticism being like, oh, let's say for you, like making a short film being like, Hey, I present to you the short film and they go, oh, well, this kind of sucks. And for these reasons you can do better instead of just being like, this sucks and you should never right. try. Right. It's like, they should be encouraging everyone. And I think that's the whole point of education is like encourage everyone to go out and do what they want to do. and if you do it enough times, you either will get good at it or you'll realize it's not for you. That's very well said. I couldn't have said it better myself. So, <clears throat> so you're in high school, you're, um, racing, 
missing 50, 60 days. Sometimes <laughs> you were saying you, you had friends and stuff noticing you weren't there. What was that like for, because, you know, you started elaborating on this, you're spending time with older people um, and, and just more experience. I don't even think it's, it's age necessarily. That's a byproduct of experience, right? Or maybe experience is a byproduct of age, but however you want to look at it, <clears throat> how did you, because socializing in high school is probably like, I don't have many friends I went to high school with, but like at the, I, I did for a long time, right? Yeah. And that was my group. So how was your social circle? How did you maintain friendships? How did you go through this crucial time in, in life for anyone to learn how to socialize and, and, you know, come out in a, in a positive way and have positive relationships? So I think one thing to sort of note with racing was I had a lot of friends at the racetrack. Um, and those friends were some of the closest friends and people that I'll be friends with for my entire life. Um, and like that always stayed with you. And there are people I was always in contact with. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the friends that you meet, for example, like in the national karting scene, often follow you throughout the ranks as you move up through racing. So those people are like always familiar faces. That makes sense. But yeah. when it came to being back at home, um, it depended like on the year. I think sophomore and junior year, I was definitely a lot more comfortable just kind of doing my own thing because I was pretty heavily motivated to be good in school and having free time in school. I just spent getting my work done so I could go home mm -hmm. and you know, play on my simulator or like do something racing related and have my mind on that. Um, and then nearer to the end of junior year, I met who's my best friend now who I hang out with all the time. His name's Dimitro. Uh, and he's like also super motivated in a lot of different ways. Um, and we just became very, very close. And then that just kind of was like the only real friend I needed at school was him. And we'd just hang out whenever and outside yeah. of school, whenever I was home. And that was more than enough to kind of, um, fulfill me when it came to like personal relationships. Right. Well, that's good. I mean, especially at that age to have someone that you build that friendship with where, cause you know, like people, they get, I don't know if jealous is necessarily the right word, but when you're in that, you know, group of people, when you're, you know, younger, it's why are you doing this and not hanging out with us or with me or spending time with this relationship uh, or friendship? You know, it's, it's good that you were able to have that. I think that's awesome. And you guys are still friends now, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, awesome. yeah, I mean, as, as much as we can hang out with him being in college and me racing, but we, yeah, still are constantly in contact. So, I That's mean, great. we really forged like our friendship throughout COVID. And I know for most people, COVID was like a terrible, terrible thing. And it definitely was nationally, but oddly enough for me, it was like, it worked out really well. Um, yeah. my life got put on a pause, like everything racing and school. Uh, and then like in our hometown, no one would go out. So me and Demetra like would just spend every day together, like playing basketball and like watching sunsets and just doing our thing. And it was just like such a transformative year for me, like just learning how to be like a real human being. That's actually really interesting because you always hear, and you mentioned it, you always hear the opposite stories about COVID where people were more isolated. They lost friendships, marriages ended, relationships ended. And to hear that you were able to foster like could be a lifelong friendship is really a nice outcome to hear for once when it comes to COVID. For sure. Yeah, I was very, very lucky for my situation there. First of all, how did you meet your girlfriend? And what is that like? Because you're traveling, she's in school, how often do you see each other? How do you keep that connection? Because that, that's hard when you can see each other every day and talk every day. And, um, you know, you're, you're in a bit of a unique situation. Yeah, definitely. Um, so a friend of mine, well, actually a friend of Demetra's who I became mutual friends with, um, she lived around here, um, went to school and was in my grade. Um, she went to college with my current girlfriend, Katie, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, brought her back to New York at one point. And we just kind of met there. I immediately took her out on a date and we just kind of hit it off. Um, and then on a whim, they went to school in Colorado. On a whim, I just flew out to Colorado for a week just to go hang mm -hmm. out with her after going on one date, which definitely was out of pocket for sure. Um, but yeah, it ended up great and definitely have had a lot of rough patches with the like distance and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, she goes to school in Colorado and lives in Wisconsin and I live in New York. So there's no time where we're like overlapping. Like if no. we're seeing each other, it's a flight, right? I don't know. It's been great. Like I'll fly out to Colorado. I get to spend like two weeks training in Colorado, hang out with her while she's in school. I'm in school too. So it kind of like functions correctly. And in a weird way, as much as it's like, I'm super busy and I'm doing stuff. I'm also kind of extremely flexible 
because if I'm not racing on a race weekend, my school is completely asynchronous, so I can be wherever I want right. at any time. Um, so if if I'm not racing, I can just fly out there uh, and hang out. So it's it's been really great, and and it's good to have someone you know kind of like a rock in my life. Yeah. So is she back home in Wisconsin now for some summer? Yeah, for summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's interning at Baird. So okay, okay, very yeah. nice. So this is. Um, you know, some of the, the meat and potatoes I wanted to ask you about your, so you're a professional athlete at 20 years old, which is not too unique, right? There's a lot of people that get professional in basketball, other sports, football, uh, relatively young, but what is the, like, how do you stay sane? This is a lot, you're in school. So I, you know, just, just as a frame of reference, I went to school full-time while working full-time. I went online as well because um, I had to put myself through school. So it was, you know, work full time Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sundays were schoolwork, homework, papers, all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, trying to maintain relationships with friends, with girlfriends, with family, all that stuff. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot. Of, and you don't have time. How do you like, what are some of the things you do to keep your sanity and focus? Like you have to, and I'm sure you got into this as well. You have to get very good at compartmentalizing. Um, and there was a huge part of, of learning to get very good at like the second I got home from a race weekend, um, or I guess backtracking, like when I was younger and I first was in racing, both in go-karting and when I was starting out in cars, my entire psyche was affected by the result that I had produced that weekend. So if I went to a race weekend and I was terrible all weekend or had a really bad race result, I came home and was just miserable for like weeks mm -hmm. until the next time I got a shot at it, which what did miserable ruined look like? miserable just looks like unmotivated in a way i mean in a like i just it was a reflection on myself and so i just ended up very very insecure and it was very easy for me to question if i was good enough to be in the position i was in um because right. i was fortunate to have a lot of great relationships and a lot of great people both on the racing and personal side and it just made me question if i deserved everything i was getting and if i was mm. good enough for everything i was doing that sort of thing um right. and it wasn't like it didn't take a big event to get me there. It took very, very little to push myself back into that little zone. Um, and it just, it makes it really hard to accomplish things. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, anyone who's dealt with some form of depression at any time, like the second you get into that state, it just feels like accomplishing any goal is next to impossible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so one of the biggest switches that helped me a ton was his name is Jacques Delaire. Uh, he's a performance coach. Um, he works in every field from like, racing to beauty pageants to really anything business people um and he just really helped me work through the difference between what i can and can't control and allowing the stuff that i can't control just to kind of flow by and not right. grasping onto it so hard because in life um but specifically in racing you know i can't control the other cars on track i can't control when i have an engine blow up or something like that and it causes a bad result and it doesn't do me any good sitting on it and getting all annoyed and upset that the result wasn't what I wanted to, because all it's going to do is inhibit my performance going forward. So he kind of, obviously it all sounds very simple, but I think the biggest thing he did was give me the keys to effectively employ all of those different things, all those different mm -hmm. techniques and actually control how I'm steering my brain and, you know, allowing those negative thoughts and positive thoughts and, and how I take away from, bad results or from different situations. And, you know, obviously that I went through that for my racing, um, because I had one really bad season that really affected me mentally. Um, okay. and that was basically to help me separate the mental side from my own performance. Obviously they're always like one thing, but being able to bring my performance level back with the mental side, um, because I definitely lost an edge when it came to mm -hmm. just being able to perform in a race car because I was so in my head. Um, but that bled into my entire life. I mean, everything I do, uh, what I learned from Jacques has some amount of influence. Feel, aside from, you know, obviously feeling kind of like, you know, a failure, like what were some of the other feelings that you had? Was it letting people down, letting yourself down? Yeah, I, I have this weird pride thing with my parents. Like I really want them to be proud of me and I really want to like make them proud. And no matter how many times I talk to them about it, they're always like, no matter what you do, we're going to be proud of you. And I'm so lucky to have such supportive people in my life. Um, but 
I always, let's say, outsourced whenever I felt like I wasn't doing a good job. Like right. whenever I felt like I didn't accomplish what I needed to accomplish, I just assumed everyone was upset with me for not accomplishing that. Um, whereas it's a normal feeling to have, I think. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's not even just in high pressure environments. It can be in anything in life. Um, right. and, and, but that's the thing, like all this stuff translated from racing to normal life. Like it's not as if like it was, it was singularly focused on just racing that, that mindset and the issues that I was struggling with were part of my day to day life. It was just more evident in racing because it reflected in performance. Mm -hmm. It helps you realize how much it actually inhibits you. Um, and, and I think that's actually something people don't have. And you have kind of the benefit of that being an athlete or being in some form of very high pressure environment is it kind of squeezes everything out and makes it very obvious when something's going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like in day to day life, like when I was at home, let's say even during COVID and I wasn't racing and I was still dealing with those mental issues, it's way harder to identify because you don't really have any like huge wall of pressure forcing right. those issues to be like a massive inhibitor. Instead, they're just kind of riding along in the background, making day to day life a little bit harder than it needs to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of the biggest things that Jacques worked with me on, it, it was all just like, the metaphor was like steering your ship, right? The rudder that mm -hmm. steers sort of the ship of your brain, what direction it goes. Um, the subconscious only hears what you're saying. It doesn't hear the context, right? So if you say you don't want to do something, you're going to do that thing because it doesn't hear the not. There's no context there. Right. You need to really be able to get into that flow state, which is not really thinking and just focusing on the task at hand and kind of letting everything flow through your head without latching onto it. That's very, very good. That's a, I can't, it took me like till I was 30 to, to learn that. So good for you. And even now, that. yeah, even now it's like, it, that's a hard one to overcome. Um, you know, and, and I know for me it's, and I'm not under like that kind of pressure at all. Uh, I've been, you know, pressure at work, pressure in relationships and stuff like that. But I feel like the hardest thing to do is to, realize that like what happens to you, you got to like shed the stuff that isn't meant for you and shed the, the negativity and not get caught in, in the site. I call it the cycle of suck where you're just like in this, something bad happens. It puts you in a bad mood. Something else bad happens because of that bad mood or that, you know, bad mindset. And then you're back in it again and you just stay in this cycle. And it's, it's really hard to break out of that. And it's really hard to, let go of a bad performance or, um, you know, I know it's when I would public speak, if I would jumble a line or something, I would immediately just be like, well, this whole thing sucks. <laughs> so, so it's, it's like, it's, a, it's tough when you're, when you're out there, when you're, when you're performing in front of people too, and the expectations on you are coming from all different ways. Like you've got your own, your family, your friends, your coaches, the audience, your sponsorships, like, do you want to share? How do you manage that? That's a lot of pressure. Yeah, I think one of the weirdest things, like, as you grow up in racing, I don't know, let's say I had like, the first time I really had sponsors at the track was in USF 2000, which was, say, three years ago, and four years ago. So in that range. Um, and if you had a bad result, and you had a meeting with sponsors, like, 20 minutes after the race, you got out of the race car, you took your race suit off, and then you had to show people around your race car after you just like finished 10th when you felt like you should have been able to win a race kind of thing. Right. And it was just this really weird, like, I need to take a deep breath, put a face on, and then be able to work with everyone in like and entertain as mm -hmm. that's what my job is as, as you know, as someone they're sponsoring. But like that almost helped me a lot of the time. Um, I didn't see it as added pressure. I really enjoy talking to people and I enjoy teaching people about racing because it's something that I'm seriously passionate about. So I love mm -hmm. to be able to sort of share that with people. Um, and it stopped that cycle of suck, you know, basically. I mean, it, it was, it, that's it a perfect tracks. analogy for what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because immediately I have to just be like, okay, now I'm happy and I want to work with these people. And then it's not like after it, I just immediately go back into sulking and being upset. It's like then after I'm like, all right, well, I did that well, or I enjoyed talking to these yeah. people and maybe I made a new connection. And from there on, I'll just move forward. Like that's life. That's how it goes. Well, and I'm sure they're like super excited to even have the opportunity to 
to learn from you and be there. And so you're, you're almost like, it's like gratitude, right? When you, when you practice gratitude, like you're generally a little bit happier. So it's, and when you're yeah. people, and then they're grateful for it too. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And it's, there's never, ever been, so obviously like sponsors aren't, you're not like talking to the head of the company at the race event. That's all like right. outside of that, making business deals. The people who are at the, the race event are usually customers or something like that. And yeah, like all they are, most of them have either never been to a race or they've been to a race and they've never been behind the scenes. So they're all just so stoked to be like around a race right. car that they're all so excited. And that's inherently going to rub off on you in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it was always really enjoyable and I continue to enjoy it and going out to dinners with all of them and, and all that stuff. It's never been like a task. It's always like these people all really enjoy being here. Um, and no one ever comes who's not interested in racing. So it's, it's always an enjoyable part of the day. Well, yeah, you're getting an opportunity to interact with, I mean, your people pretty much or people that understand and appreciate what you do. And I think that's, it's a little bit different on my end, but sometimes people, um, you know, they'll ask me, does it bother you when people recognize you? And I'm like, no, because I can honestly make someone's day just by saying hi or treating them like a human or taking a picture with them. And that's like, it's the, you know, it, it's, it's not really for anything relevant, but like, it's, you know, it's nice to make someone's day and it does, it just kind of like puts you in a, in a positive mindset, just interacting yeah. with people that want to interact with you. Yeah. And I think as much as it like makes their day in a way, it makes your day as well, because you're like, I was just able to like make someone's day. It makes you feel good. It makes them feel good, you know, pay it forward kind of thing. And, you know, we have the same experience. I mean, for me, even just driver coaching, like working with someone for a full day and seeing them improve and be happy about improving, like there's no better feeling than being like, hey, I just like helped that person get to a better spot than where they were before. Right. So you do driver coaching. Yeah, yeah. So my That's my cool. full time job when I'm home um, and where I was yesterday and, and where I'm going to continue to be most of this month is uh, it's a place called Monticello Motor Club. It's a think about a country club, but instead of golfing, there's a racetrack and a bunch of race cars. Right. Um, and you know, day to day, you work with different people, or you build up a group of clientele who you work with more consistently. Um, and I love working with my groups of people who I've been working with for a while. And it's honestly a lot of fun to even work with the people who are brand new, because they're like, a lot of people come there with no idea what they're getting themselves into just rent a car. <laughs> and like, right. I've had I work with people like a lot of the times there'll be a guy who is a member and they'll bring like their wife or their girlfriend along. And the wife or girlfriend always shows up and they're like, I don't want to do it. I don't think I'm going to enjoy it. Like, da, da, da. And then by the end of the day, they're so stoked. and want to come back the next time and do more driving. Awesome. Right. And it's great. It's so much fun to be able to like change someone's mind about racing because yeah, it's just such a, it's such an awesome thing. And it's so cool. Anyone can enjoy it no matter what. And a lot of the times, like at a basic level, when it comes to driving a road car on track, like you really need no experience and you don't need any sort of like physical prowess to be good at it. You can just kind of sit there and enjoy it. I was actually going to ask you, what would you say to someone who hasn't raced, but maybe wants to try, but you answered that already there. That's good. What is, um, like how, what are the types of people you're coaching? Is it, is it all ages? Is it people that are up and coming? It's really all ages and all like all mentalities, right? I have two kids who are under 20, um, uh, who are both like racing Miatas, trying to get into real racing. Um, I have some people who just do the racing at the club and enjoy that. Mm. And then there's a lot of people there who just bought a car and want to get it, drive it to the maximum that it can be driven. And that's why they bought that car and they just want to enjoy it and treat it a lot more like a country club where, mm. you know, there's not everyone at a golf country club is trying to go play in like some major game. They just want to yeah. hang out and play golf and drink and do their thing with their family. And a lot of the times it's the same experience at the club. That's fun. That's fun. So I, I want to touch again, um, since we never really did go back to different ages. So when I was filmmaking, um, my first year in college, and this was, this was like such a weird thing for me, which is why I'm curious to get your experience. I, so I, I had like open auditions. I, so I made an independent study at school to make a movie. So I had open auditions and I had people coming in that were 18 and I had people coming in that were like 50. And it was everywhere in between too. And so I ended up, you know, with this, this casting crew of like 20 or 25 people to make this movie over the course of a semester. And I was like in the leader, right? I wrote the script. I was directing it. I was co-producing it with my best friend at the time. And 
I just remember like the dynamic of, of interacting with people that were in their thirties, forties, maybe even fifties and people that were my age, it really helped me first of all, like realize age is a number. If you have something in common and you have, you know, any kind of, of, you know, connection, you can really be friends with anybody. So it, at first it was super weird for me to be like, Oh, these are my good friends. And they're like thirties, forties and fifties and I'm 18. But it helped me sort of my friend group then got older naturally, but it did. It sort of helped me develop like communication skills, um, you know, how to build connections with people because you're forced to. So what is, and you alluded to it earlier. And then I, I had a hard time spending time with people that were like strictly my age that just wanted to party all the time that just wanted to go out and get drunk or, or, you know, even at 21, like just go to clubs. And believe me, I did some of that too, but (laughs) <laughs> I'm not, I'm not downplaying it, but you know, I found myself having like much more, um, you know, Friday nights at, at Denny's working on trying to crack the code for our next scene, you know, until two, three in the morning. And I was like, I'd much rather do that in some instances. So I, I would imagine because you've had similar experiences, but what is it like when you're working with people and spending time with people both professionally and casually that are across the age spectrum? Um, for me, like, obviously a lot of the people that I'm working with who are older are all in racing and Mm -hmm. it's so easy to get along with people who are in racing because there's so many motorsports out there and the people who are really in racing, not like, I mean, a lot of race fans as well, but the people who are actually competing, either drivers, engineers, mechanics, all that stuff are just diehard race fans Mm -hmm. at heart that it's just so easy to get along with everyone because you always have something to talk about and people to make fun of and stuff like that. Right. It was the same with the filmmaking. Like we wanted to talk about filmmaking. We want to talk about movies and those don't have an age cap. Yeah. And you just have an endless stream of information to talk about. You could talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, and a lot of the times I really got along with engineers because I'm very interested in it. Um, and I really like love that side of racing. I think it's really interesting, like the way different people can find different solutions to the same problem. Um, and the exact same thing in filmmaking, like there's a million different filmmakers out there and uh, every film's different, obviously they're not all identical and there's just a million different solutions to certain problems. Um, and, and that's what you continue to figure out as you move throughout racing and as cars get more complex, same thing, but going off track there, um, when it came to people, my age, um, it was limited with the amount that I hung out with people. Um, I didn't have a ton of time to a and B I wasn't super interested in working hard to make those relationships happen as kind of convoluted as that sounds. I was, yeah, I just, I didn't, this sounds really cliche, but like I didn't fit in. It was just more like I was differently motivated. Um, and like, I think I went to one high school party in my entirety of high school and I've never been to a club or bar at this point, like other than like to eat food. Um, I'm just very diehard on making it and racing. Um, and also part of being an athlete kind of comes into the like not drinking, not doing drugs yeah. thing. Like that's definitely a part of it. I know a lot of people who do and a lot of people who don't. I can't specifically say it inhibits performance, but I also don't want to find out in a way. Um, and I don't really have any crazy interest in it. So I, I get along really well with a lot of my friends who are very motivated towards a goal, um, mm-hmm. who are trying to reach towards something. Even if it's different than racing, because oh, yeah. you have that commonality that, hey, I'm working towards something. Exactly. Um, and I think also as my friends have grown up, grown up and gotten into college, I've actually made, like remade friends with a lot of my friends who I was friends with in high school. That was a mouthful. Um, a lot of people who I was friends with in high school, I'm now friends with again after yes. like a three or four year age gap of not talking. Um, because suddenly, like I, one of my closest friends lives down the street, Jeremy, um, and you know now he's getting into investment banking, he's really interested on being on that side of things. And he's working really, really hard towards a goal. Uh, And then suddenly we met back up and we were just very similarly motivated. Um, And I think that's common throughout anyone who like has a goal that they're striving for and they're devoting themselves to. You just end up, you know, having a lot of very productive and forward facing conversations and learning a lot from each other. And that's what I'm interested in doing from friends. I have to tell you, like, you're so mentally, you're so far ahead of like anyone, <laughs> like even people I know now in my life, like that is, that took me to like, it took me, I would honestly say until maybe five years ago, I'm 38, five years ago, I would have, I would force relationships and like they, they would just take 
and drain me. And I'd be in these endless conversations about absolutely nothing and just, you know, drama. And ironically, you know, being on a reality TV show, I, I don't like drama. <laughs> like I don't, <laughs> I don't like, I, I want to talk about ideas. I want to talk about, you know, um, filmmaking back in the day or, or, you know, whatever this stuff now, like how people really are as human beings, because, that's what matters. And you don't have to be for everybody and everybody's not for you. And when you start like looking inward to figure out, here's the kind of person I am, here's how I want to show up in the world. And you, you hold other people to that, that account too. And that standard, and you, you put boundaries up for those that aren't. And all of a sudden you just start, you know, I say it again, shedding the people that aren't for you. And then all of a sudden you're in your right group of people and you're getting stimulating conversations and you're building meaningful relationships and meaningful connections. And all of a sudden, like you're not being dragged down anymore. And that doesn't mean you can't have people in your life that you, that you, you know, keep at an arm's distance away or keep as acquaintances. That's totally fine. But you're like at this place already where you already know like who your people are. And I think that's awesome to see. It's clear you've done a lot of work to, to get to that point too. So thank yeah, you for that. I appreciate that for sure. And it, it wasn't like for lack of trying, I definitely had plenty of people in my life who took away from, you know, the percentage of, of brain power I had towards other things. And, and I've been in relationships that were very toxic and stuff yeah. like that. But that's all stuff you go through when you're, you know, in high school and being a teenager yeah. and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I can pay a lot of it towards my parents for kind of having a very hands off approach with parenting in a way like letting me being very open to me doing whatever I wanted. But if I screwed up the consequences, you know, they were going to be on me, they weren't going to solve problems for me. Um, yeah. And I think from a very young age, it just meant that like, I mean, honestly, talking about alcohol and stuff like that, I was never crazy motivated to like go drink like crazy, because it was never sheltered, it was never hidden from me, right? Like when my parents mm -hmm. would drink, I would like take a sip of wine or something like that. No, I wasn't getting drunk. But it just meant that like, it was always kind of a part of my life. So it wasn't anything new when all of a sudden all my friends started drinking. Right. Um, and that also wasn't like we were a board game group of friends. We weren't a drinking group of friends, you know, like yeah. we just kind of hung out and chatted, played video games and whatever. <laughs> it was never like this group of friends who were like, yeah, let's go party or anything like that. Like that was the people who I hung out with were never that way. Um, and I don't think I'll ever really turn out to be that way. It's just like not what I enjoy. And I think a lot of that comes from also just being introverted. Like, I was I, gonna ask you if you were introverted, yeah. I kind of sensed it. Yeah, for sure. I'm not. I'm not the type of person who's gonna go to a party and like, be super pumped to see like, hundreds <laughs> of people like I'm yeah. very content with like a group of five people or three people just like chatting and talking about stuff more intently. Yeah, that's so true. I always say I have six friends, and I don't really need to to meander out besides them unless someone is super intriguing and you know bring bring into your life but um i think yeah i'm introverted too and and you say you were board games i was movies like we would just go see movies every friday and saturday and um you know then i would go by myself on sundays and it would just be <laughs> this like cool thing where like i said we'd be at denny's you know working trying to crack the code of our next project until two three in the morning and and, you know, that was much more relevant to me at that time to spend time doing that stuff that was like stimulating me uh, instead of being out with, you know, and I knew people that would party every weekend. I knew people that would sometimes, but I really felt like the most complete, like I, when I was, you know, challenging my brain to, to, you know, think about big ideas. For sure. And, you know, I don't, I don't have any hatred towards anyone who like does go out and party. I totally understand that concept for sure. It's. It's just more what I enjoy doing and in a different direction, right? Um, plenty of people who go to clubs every weekend end up being extremely successful in plenty of different outcomes. But yeah, I mean, I love that too. And I was, I've always been into photography and videography. I have like, I don't know, 15 cameras sitting lined up across up here right oh, above my cool. desk. Um, and yeah, I've always been super into that side of things. So I definitely get it. I love the creative side of mostly photography for me. And it's just so cool to, yeah talk to someone who's similarly minded. Yeah. Do you have a specific type of um, photography you enjoy? Is it like landscapes, portraits, or just anything? Um, it ranges. I mean, for a long time, I shot sports, um, shot a lot of mm. racing for a bit. Um, I did that, you know, 
professionally, which just means I was paid to do it. Um, right. But I, I did that sort of thing. And really now it's kind of what I have on me. I usually have a 35 mil film camera, like always in my bag, just to shoot stuff so cool. at race events or whenever I'm traveling. Um, but I'm trying to get more into video film stuff. I have a lot of super eight cameras. Um, so my, my grandpa, my dad's dad was like super, super into photography and videography. Um, and I have, well, all of this is all of his old cameras, plus a couple that I've added to the collection and they all work after a bit of my finagling perfectly fine. Um, so the biggest issue is a buying film cause it's so expensive now and B getting it developed. Like isn't Kodak like the only one that makes yep. 35 millimeter now? Yeah. Uh, Fuji's still making 35 mil, but when it comes to, uh, video format film, like there's nothing super eight Kodak still makes super eight, but it's like 50 bucks a roll. And then it's like seven minutes too. Isn't a roll just seven minutes or something? Three and a half. (laughs) Three and a half. Okay. I knew it was short. Yeah. You have three and a half minutes of film and then it's about a hundred bucks to get it developed. Right. Like when you (laughs) include shipping and everything. So you think about three and a half minutes of video and I I have Super 8 film and every time I put it in a camera, I feel like it's very inhibiting because I'm so like, I don't want to waste. Yeah. You got to do a cost value analysis of it. Exactly. <laughs> like I don't want to waste like 10 seconds of film shooting something that isn't worthwhile. And then it just kind of ruins the whole experience because, and that's the great thing of having like a 35 mil camera is you just on eBay buy like a box of 200 rolls of film for $12. That's all expired and mm. walk around, shoot random photos. And if they come out cool, then awesome. And if they don't, then whatever. Um, but yeah. the more you shoot, the more come out the way you want them to be. Well, I think this is, that's super cool. I, I didn't know that coming into this. So I, I love that you do that and you have that sort of creative outlet. Um, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, which obviously photography and videography is one of them. What are some of the ways that you recharge or step away from racing and sort of, uh, fulfill your, your other hobbies? Recently has been climbing, um, actually. So rock climbing and mostly indoors in a gym, it's like, it's actually been interesting. I found once I started doing it, I found a lot of other race car drivers that do it and a lot of other athletes oh, that do it on the outside of whatever sport that they do. Cause a, it's obviously like, it's a very physical thing. Um, and it's an easy way to train because it doesn't feel like training. Um, but it takes so much brain power and it's just solving puzzle after puzzle. And mm. there's a million different ways to solve every little puzzle. Um, as well as it's another way to get, I, I don't like, I say relationship with failure, but that's not really what it is. Like mm-hmm. there are times when you go to the climbing gym and you're like, oh, I feel really strong today. And you can just be horrible <laughs> all day and have no idea why it sucked so bad. And another time you can go and all of a sudden everything that felt impossible feels super easy. Um, and that's the coolest thing, like being able to show up to a gym and leave knowing, all right, I tried my hardest and maybe I didn't accomplish anything, but right. I did what I could. And that's not something that we get outside of, the climbing gym, right? Because in racing, right. like if I show up to a weekend and I sucked, I can't just go to like my sponsor or the team and be like, well, I tried my best. Like that's not yeah. enough, right? That's not <laughs> right. the, they don't really care. Um, so it's cool to have that like ability to be very comfortable with not completing your, your set out goal um, and, and working towards something. Sometimes too, I, I, I go to the gym. I don't rock climb. I'm not that strong, but I go to the, I go to the gym and sometimes it's like the worst workout ever, but I'm like, Hey, stayed in the habit came that's something so yeah, that's all it takes yeah. like and i like every single athlete has the exact same mentality and the if you watch one of those like instagram videos where they're like oh look at my daily routine like this is what i do every day all of that's a farce like it's so so hard to stay in that routine right i'm mm-hmm. supposed to be well i train six days a week i climb usually three of those six days just to stay physically fit to be good yeah. enough in a race car um and it's never easy. It's never going to be easy. It's not like there's any time. I mean, there are days where I'm like psyched to go to the gym, but majority of the days I'm like, I don't want to do this. I have no interest. And you know, even if I can't complete fully my set out workout for the day, I make it a point to just go, I'm going to go to the gym. And if I can't complete a full workout, that's fine. At least I went and kept in the habit and allowed it to keep going. And yeah, I think that's an important thing to have for everyone is like get pressure off of I need to go spend two hours at the gym or else it's not worth going kind of thing. Right. I totally get that. Um, so <clears throat> I know I asked you this last time we talked, but that poster behind you, the Halloween one, big Halloween fan right here. It's, <laughs> it's, it's actually the movie that inspired me to want to film make. So it was, um, 
I saw it when I, so my dad, my parents were divorced and my dad used to take us to the video store. And once my sisters would go to bed, they were a little younger. Like I could always pick out a horror movie to watch because he would love me to watch them there and then go home to my mom and be scared shitless. And, um, I think it was like 12 or 13 when I first started watching the Halloween movies, uh, with my dad. And I just don't know what it was about Halloween. I just became obsessed with it. And then I learned about how they made it and how they were like literally sweeping up leaves because they filmed it in LA, sweeping up leaves from the Midwest, bringing them over to LA, dumping them out in a scene and then sweeping them up and moving them to the next scene. And I just thought like, man, I could do that. And um, anyway, so I love the poster. (laughs) Tell us about it. Oh, so so this poster, this came from from the girlfriend, actually, um, in their previous apartment. At some point, they were friends with someone who uh, worked in an art studio, and they had all of these like crazy posters that were all hung up. The art studio was closing, and they just gave them to, to Katie and, and the friend that introduced me to Katie. Um, and that is two of them, and a bunch of the other ones are still in their possession at the house they live in now. That's cool. Very cool. I love it. So have you seen Halloween? I haven't. You haven't. Okay. I haven't. No. Do you well, like scary movies? It. Um, I can be persuaded. I don't. Okay. I wouldn't say it's like my number one genre, but I can be persuaded. What is your number one genre? I, I don't know. I don't know how to do genres when it comes to films. I have like favorite films, but yeah, let's hear those just for fun. Um, I think number one's Donnie Darko for me. <laughs> Donnie Darko inspired my second movie that I yeah. ever made. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that movie. Yeah. I love Donnie Darko. I think there's, I mean, the word isn't lore, but there's just so much behind it and so many interesting things to talk about when finishing it. And I think the first time I watched it, I definitely was like, I have no idea what's going on, but it's really cool. <laughs> and yeah. then eventually you go back to it and you're like, all right, now I'm starting to get there. Yeah. Um, I think the original Blade Runner is up mm-hmm. there for me. Just Good. such a beautiful, yeah. And I mean, even the new one is also just so beautiful. So well put together shot wise. Um, Grand Budapest Hotel. That's up there. Comedy. <laughs> that's a good one too. Yeah. Also just really pretty. I mean, Wes Anderson and all the colors that he's, yeah, his color palettes are so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. I, I love his movies, but it is, it's the color palettes, the way they're shot. It's, they're so like, each one has like its own unique personality, even though they're all kind of similar. And I, I love yeah. that about Wes Anderson's films. hundred percent. And, but it is just the shots, like the way that they're formatted and the colors of the, the color palette throughout it. Like he creates so much humor in like, regardless of dialogue or the characters that are in the scene, just in like the shot length and the way it's, it's framed yeah, can make its own amount of comedy. And, and yeah, it's so cool. That's how I feel about the Coen brothers too, like Fargo. Yeah. yeah I don't know if you've seen any of those. Their, <clears throat> their movies, the way they frame things up and the way they just kind of let the camera sit a little bit longer than you would think they would. And you yeah. just capture like these moments that almost seem like they're candid moments. Um, it's yeah. Great. The way of the way a film is shot is so much more important than people think. And, yeah. and I think it takes such a creative eye to do that. hundred percent. And for the most part, it's really easy for it to go over your head because obviously you're just watching it and it's like, Oh, well, of course, like it's intuitive that it's framed that way, but it's not intuitive when you're starting from nothing being there and creating a set. Like obviously once the set's creative, it, created it's a bit more intuitive to go okay we need to sort of frame this in this way but before from the ground up it's crazy how much it takes to get from an empty blank room to a movie set yeah even even if you're on location just setting it up it's a whole whole different beast to to get your set whether it's real life or built from scratch it's 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 an art it's an art it's the reason we have set designers yeah for sure (laughs) Cool. So um, before we finish up here, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask me anything that may be you're curious about me or my experience or anything, really. I'm an open book. Yeah, I think now that we've talked this whole time, I mean, so what was the motivation to get onto reality TV? Um, ooh. So there wasn't really motivation at first. I never really consumed reality TV. Um, I had watched one season of The Bachelor, which I've said that multiple times, but um, for me, they actually reached out to me on LinkedIn and I went back after that and watched season one. Cause I had heard of it. Everybody had watched love is blind during COVID cause it came out right before lockdowns. And so everyone was talking about it and it just wasn't my thing. And when I went back and watched it, I was like, Oh, this is actually kind of interesting. People seem genuine. Um, I could see how, you know, this could work. Like you, 
just get to know someone based on what you talk about and their personality and not see them. And I thought to myself, okay, maybe this could work. And then the next thing I know I'm there. And then shortly after that, I'm married. So it's like very much so this, um, so yeah, you, you know, going on one date with your girlfriend and then flying to Colorado, I got married in seven weeks to someone that I met without seeing. So no judgment there. Things happen. They happen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just very, it was a very, it's very surreal when I think about it. I, I say I sleepwalked into it because I just, I had never, it would never have crossed my radar really. I mean, I had some friends that tried to get me to um, try out to be the bachelor a number of years ago. Uh, and it's it just, I was just like, it's just not my like realm. I don't, you know, I'm not really into what like people do and say, I'm more into like people's ideas and you know, what's the big picture here or what's really going on here or why are people thinking this way and stuff like that. Um, so it, it isn't, it, it's just so out of my wheelhouse and I feel like I just kind of sleepwalked into it because I thought, oh, I like the concept after watching it. I think it could work. It addresses all my criticisms of dating and people not taking time to get to know each other and being superficial. And, um, you know, I wasn't on dating apps anymore for a while. And it was just, just seemed kind of like, I don't know, intuitive to start it. It felt like, okay, this is a good idea. And then all of a sudden I was there. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Just because yeah. from speaking to you, it doesn't sound like, I guess Love is Blind is somewhat different, but like, it doesn't sound like he would have ended up in reality TV in any format. Like, it, yeah, mm. for sure. So it's very interesting. Um, and then did you have any motivation to like become famous? Was there any motivation? Did you have interest in becoming famous? So here's the, the interesting thing about that is I was voted in eighth grade and I went to a small Catholic school. So it was 18 of us graduating. I think I was wow. voted most likely to be famous. But I was going to be famous because when I was a young, younger and, you know, I went to school with these people from second grade to eighth grade, all 18 of them. So we, <laughs> we all grew up together a little bit and I wanted to be a WWE wrestler when I was a kid. That was like my first aspiration from like two, three years old. Um, and then the filmmaking part. And then I also had like political desires to be president. Like I would always, I would dress up as a president for Halloween. I would. I just wanted to be the president. But if the theme here is like from being a screenwriter and a director, a professional wrestler, kind of, but um, president, it was all these things that were going to be for my ideas, not for me. So the unique thing was I, I didn't have any desires to like be famous, but I, if I was going to be famous, it was going to be for my ideas. And then I ended up getting famous for my relationship. So it is totally, it's like totally a mind a mind fuck, to be honest, for me when I think about it, because I never wanted to be that. And, you know, I'm very politically active. I'm very, I'm active in my community. I, you know, I just worked on the Brandon Johnson campaign. He's the new mayor of Chicago um, to get him elected. So like, I'm involved in that way. And I always thought it would be like something that I did there. And I will say, um, you know, maybe it'll, it'll change that way. But, um, it's just weird because my desires to be famous were not like why I got quote famous. Yeah, for sure. I definitely get that. And, and I mean, in a way it's like you wanted to, you didn't want to get famous, but you wanted to make something that was seen. Yeah. Cause I believe, I firmly believe that when you go into somewhere, whether it be a job, whether it be a friendship, a relationship, whether it be reality TV or, you know, in your case, racing, like I want to leave something better than I found it. And yeah. even, even if like, that's that a relationship or a friendship ending, I hope there was a lesson there that they learned. And I hope that there's a lesson there that I learned. So you can always, always continue to get better, but not at the expense of other people. So now I have a, a not profit organization designed to help reality cast members get mental health support and um, uh, legal support called the UCAN Foundation. And this is, you know, my attempt to leave because reality TV is very exploitative. My attempt to leave that industry better than I found it. And so, <laughs> you know, I don't want, I want to say I want to get like famous for that, but I think that's more in my wheelhouse of, of actually like making a difference and, and getting my hands dirty doing that. Yeah, definitely. hundred percent. I mean, it sounds like you're doing that also politically with everything else going on. 
I'm certainly trying. <laughs> I'm certainly trying. I'm like the chihuahua that won't start, stop gnawing on their ankle. That's how it right now. What are you doing? Are you filmmaking or what are you doing on that side of things? Um, you... So politically right now, <laughs> that's another funny thing. So I've been in politics like for, since 2008 with Obama. That was when wow. I first got involved. And um, people tell me like <laughs> on social media, like stay in your lane, reality star. Stop talking about politics. What are you, that's... a Trumper? And it's like, what? I, I live, like, there's a, a whole Reddit conspiracy that I was a Trumper. I'm like, what? I'm like, you go on my social media, it's like Bernie Sanders, everything for 2016 and 2020, like working on the campaign, attending events, like working to get the most progressive mayor in Chicago's history elected. Like people are crazy. So, so politically I'm still involved in my community. I'm involved, um, you know, whenever possible to try and help force some change in the reality TV perspective, because it isn't going to come from a not-for-profit organization. It's going to come from organizing people that are um, looking to, to be treated better, looking to change the industry. And of course, people that want to leave it in a better place than we found it. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, I completely agree. And, and yeah, I think one of the biggest and coolest things you get to do is like a driver coach and meeting so many different people at a racetrack and having fans is like you can leave a very positive impact on groups of people. Uh, and in a way, it's like with very little impact to your day to day life. Like if I'm at a racetrack and I see a bunch of fans and I decide to sign something or sit down and have a conversation with someone mm -hmm. that can make someone's week. And it took me all of three seconds to take the time to go have a conversation with someone. So yeah, that's awesome. exactly what I was saying earlier about, no, I don't care if someone comes up and asks for a picture, like it makes their yeah. day. Yeah, exactly. It's great. hundred percent. So, cool. and I, in a way I can understand like the people who are that famous that are at that level of like, they can't go out in public. I get the frustration there. Like I totally understand. Oh, that. totally. Well, it was like that when the show came out and again, it didn't yeah. bother me, but like we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't go to the grocery store without getting stopped by three people. We couldn't go walking down the street without, people stopping even now sometimes going out it's it's like i always say it's like the demo so like the demo is like 18 to 35 so when i'm deciding where i'm gonna go or what i'm gonna do i have to think about that because i'm like am i in the mood to be stopped every 10 minutes every yeah, five so you minutes cannot step foot in like a starbucks or a whole foods <laughs> more or less yeah <laughs> <laughs> or yeah that. yeah or specific bars where it's like all those, but yeah. So Josh, thanks for coming on. Where can people find you on social media and your website? Uh, so Josh goes racing, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, uh, and then I, my website's joshcreenracing.com. Awesome. And those links will be in the bio. Thank you again for coming on today. This was really awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.